Good evening and welcome. My name is Louise Little. I'm the CEO of University Bookstore, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight. You have filled the rafters, and I can promise you it's going to be a very special evening. As many of you know, University Bookstore is Seattle's first and oldest bookstore, and uh, next month we celebrate 118 years. <clears throat> We're obviously very proud of that and also of the more than 400 events that we sponsor every year. And if you're interested in learning more about the events, please go our, to our website where we post them and uh, consider joining us for more. So a couple housekeeping notes. Um, tonight's event is a conversation followed by some question and answer period. And when that concludes, the exit will be out of the same door that you entered in this evening. And if you did find parking in our lot, the parking is on us. Don't worry about validation. Don't, don't worry, just leave the lot. <laughs> so um, the reason why you're here tonight um, is we are very honored and excited. In fact, I'll say it, I'm thrilled to have Dan Rather here tonight with us. And he'll be in conversation with Terry Tazioli, who's one of our favorite employees at the bookstore. I know I don't have to tell you this, but I'm going to tell it to you, that Dan Rather is one of the uh, world's best-known journalists, and over his accomplished career, which spans more than six decades, he's interviewed every president since Eisenhower and covered almost every important dateline around the world. He's um, be perhaps best known as the anchor and managing editor of the CBS Evening News, a position which he held for 24 years. When he left CBS, he created the Emmy Award-winning Dan Rather Reports on HDNet. His newest book is a collection of essays, What Unites Us, Reflections on Patriotism, and I think you all got a copy when you came in, and it was just published last month by Algonquin Books. And joining Mr. Rather tonight is Terry Tazioli. He's our own PR specialist and man about town. And, uh, I hope you'll all join me now in welcoming both Dan Rather and Terry Tazioli. Okay, who are you? <laughs> Hi, everybody. May I just echo what Louise said and, and say thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's, um, it's an honor for us to have you here. It's an honor for us and for me to have you here. So thank you well, so much. Thank you very much, Sherry, and thank you very much for that warm welcome, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So here are, here are the questions. <laughs> I don't know if any of you were here for um, Louise Penny, who also packed the house a couple months ago, and she had the nerve after I asked a couple of questions to pick up my notes, crumble them up, and throw them away, and then just said, let's talk. So you stay away from me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> let's talk. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, first off, this is, I think this is right, this is your seventh book. Is that right? That's Give or take? Right. And you've been, as they say, gathering string on this thing for, for years. And my question is, yeah, well, actually, when I was reading the book, I thought, this is not a book you could have written earlier in your career, and maybe not even mid-career. But now, what compelled you to write this particular book? Well, first of all, Harry, you're right. Uh, this is not a book I could have written 
at any other stage of my personal or professional life. Uh, what in, encouraged me to write the book were two things. First and foremost, uh, that I found so many people with the election of President Trump, rightly or wrongly, justifiably or unjustifiably, were expressing real fear, saying, you know, I'm afraid for the country. Uh, this is the first time in my experience that this many people so early or even before a presidency actually began were saying, I'm afraid for the country. Uh, so that was one thing. The second thing it, is that uh, when I got into social media, as you know, I have a Facebook page and I have uh, an internet presence called News and Guts. Uh, I, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. But at any rate, uh, I was surprised to the point of being amazed at how many people could be reached by this. I had no idea when I got into Facebook uh, that we could do posts that reached this many people. Uh, and so I asked myself, well, why is uh, the Facebook page and News and Guts attracting an audience? And what I concluded, perhaps wrongly, was that uh, people were yearning for a voice that had some experience, uh, that didn't shout, that tried to be steady and reliable, and that made some effort to put what was happening to our country into context and perspective, and some historical perspective. And the third reason was that I now have two grandsons. One is uh, just turned 20 and the other is 16. And frankly, I wanted to do a book that I thought they might actually read 10, 15 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure they do. <laughs> Are you afraid for the country? I'm always afraid for the country, but having said that, and I'm particularly afraid for the country just now, uh, I would prefer to use the word fearful of the country because, frankly, I was raised in Texas by two parents and grandparents who taught me to fear nothing but God and hurricanes. So I'm a little, I'm a little reluctant to say, but it's true, I'm fearful. Uh, however, overall and in the main, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist by nature and by experience. And I do think that we have plenty to be optimistic about if we can stop and pull back for what we call in television a wide shot, which is to see what's happening in some wide perspective. But your question is, am I fearful of the country? I am. Because, and here's why, uh, there are signs that we have moved to a president and an administration uh, that prefers an author, uh, 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 an uh, authoritarian tone and temper to leadership. And we know from history that it's a very short trip to go from authoritarianism to some form of extreme nationalism. There's a difference between nationalism and patriotism, a very important difference. So historically, what happens uh, too often to societies, it starts with an authoritarian regime then it moves to some extreme form of nationalism. And we know from fairly recent history that extreme economic nationalism in the 1920s led to the Great Depression. And then racial nationalism, Aryan nationalism, led to Adolf Hitler. And from that, it's a short distance to nativism, and beyond that is tribalism, and particularly in a country such as ours, multiracial, multi-religious, multi-ethnic, as diverse a country as I, if we ever make the final slide into tribalism, we have something, but we don't have a country, and certainly not a, a kind of country we have now. Now, we're not nearly at the back end of that, but when you say, am I fearful of the country, I am concerned that if we don't concentrate on those things which unite us, and there are things, all kinds of things that unite us. If we don't concentrate on the things that unite us, if we listen to the voices who for, to, are trying to exploit our divisions, then we really will be in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. That, well, we can, we can take that um, right into the book. You have essays on, on voting and dissent and science 
and the arts, education, the environment, uh, in inclusion, and several others. How did you come up with these? Well, I, I, I tried to spend some thought in it. I know it may strike you as rare for an author to put thought into what he's going to do. <laughs> um, I, I tried to draw on my own experience. Um, that this is the most intimate book that I've done, uh, most personally intimate book. So I thought to take uh, examples uh, from my own life, including my childhood and uh, youth years, uh, things that stuck out in my mind. For example, when my father uh, at a precinct meeting, a Democratic precinct meeting in Texas, which was racially segregated at the time, uh, when a few uh, African American Came, uh, came back from the war and wanted to participate. And, uh, you know, I was a child, but my father, uh, still in my early teens, my father took me to the precinct meeting. And it was a very tense meeting because never before had African Americans attended a precinct meeting. And uh, they took votes by standing. My father said to me, when they stand, we stand, meaning the two of us. Mm -hmm. Not that my father was a civil rights activist, he wasn't, but he had a sense of fairness. So I tried to take examples like that from my own life experiences to extrapolate to these, these larger things that do unite us. That we've had periods of great division before, and I do think that particularly younger people, and I don't want to be patronizing here, but younger people need to be reminded, we've been through some very, very difficult times as a country before, in which the country was deeply divided, the 1960s being uh, a fair example, the country was really divided over the Vietnam War, over racial issues, uh, but we came through it. That's the point, that if we hold to the, what unites us, then we can get through the worst of times. And not to forget that we went through in the uh, 19th century a catastrophic civil war. Fair to say that even I was not alive during that time. But <laughs> That's not what you said before in the green room. <laughs> but uh, in that time was the ultimate time of division for the country. But even then, it was a long, night dark, nightmarish valley for the country. And it took time because the country was very damaged and it took time to heal. When you ask me to begin, do I worry about the country now? And having admitted to you, confessed to you that I do worry about it, that real damage is being done to our institutions as we sit now. And how long that damage will extend beyond the present administration, whether it's something short of four years or four years or eight years, is a very important question. For example, with the Mueller investigation, which is very much in the news every day, that we don't know whether the Mueller investigation will turn up solid, incontrovertible, evidence that the president himself was involved in some conspiracy to affect the election with the Russians. But if the, worst, if the worst proves to be true, then we will face a constitutional crisis on what do we do about that? And the more important question, more important question is, if that worst happens and we decide what to do about it, how do we heal as a nation, as a people, in its way. I, I thought about that as I read the book, and I had this, this image, and let me test it on you, that if, if I, let's see if this works. We have an aisle. It feels to me in this country that everybody on this side of the aisle is now crammed up against the left as far as they can go. They're screaming and yelling and waving their fists at this side of the aisle, and they're all crammed up on the right side. They're also screaming and yelling at each other. There's nobody in the middle, or less they're hiding under the pews. And they're not talking to each other. And more importantly, at least in my mind, they're not listening. And if we don't listen, how do we unite or reunite? Well, we have to listen. It's, it's imperative. Let me say as an aside, and I don't mean this in any self-serving way, but I've talked to many leaders over the years, including American presidents and leaders overseas, and one common characteristic of most effective leaders is that they are good listeners. Now, 
we have to, on an individual basis and on a collective basis, number one, lower our voices, quit shouting at one another. Second, listen. It's not good enough just to hear. There's a difference between hearing and really listening and absorbing what the other says. And I would submit to you that in our history, this is very much part of the American personality, even deep in our character to do so. And when you travel the country, as I do, I like to travel, I like to meet people, I travel the country. I made a wonderful trip with my oldest grandson this last year, driving from Dallas up to uh, South Dakota. This doesn't happen out in the country with community to community. Certainly you have people in every community, some of whom can be considered pretty far right, some considered pretty far left. But on a neighborhood, neighbor to neighbor basis, on a community, community basis, when something needs to be done, if the Little League baseball field needs to be repaired, you will find Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, reactionaries, liberals, everybody pitching in. Or if the church burns down, you will find the community falling in behind and, and helping. We saw a wonderful example of it in the wake of the, speaking of hurricanes, when Hurricane Harvey hit the Texas coast in Houston. Mm -hmm. There was America at its best. People weren't shouting at one another about how, you know, damn you for your politics. People pitched in all colors, all religions, helping neighbor to neighbor. That's the real America. You would hardly know it by listening to the political dialogue, as you've just said. But what I wanted to do with what unites us, these reflections on patriotism, among the most important things is not to preach anyone. This is not intended to be a screed against President Trump, but to start a conversation. We need to have conversations with one another about how we can find common ground. It needs to be in the spirit of, listen, you and I may disagree about a hundred things, but can we find one thing, maybe two things, that will help the community, help our city, help the country, and agree on that and work on that? And having said that, I didn't intend this to be, and I don't think it is, a screed against Donald Trump. In fact, his name is not even mentioned in the book. Uh, that my hope is, and it may be a one hope, uh, that the president and Steve Bannon and some of the people around him and certainly Trump supporters will read the book. They're not going to like everything in the book, but I do think that they would read it, they would take away something of value. Now, the other night, uh, someone asked me, what, had I sent a book to President Trump? Uh, and I said, well, no, I hadn't, oh, for one reason, how do you say this gently? He doesn't have a reputation of being a big reader. <laughs> But then the thought occurred to me, well, you know, there is an audio version of this book. That's in so perhaps I can send that along. Well, he does watch TV, um, I'm, I'm told. I, I'm glad you said this, because as I was reading the book, I thought, the names stop with Barack Obama. I mean, the, the book is a bit of a memoir, because you use your experiences to tell us about your own growth right. as a journalist and as, if you will, as a human being. And I started to notice that you do talk about present times, but the na that name is never mentioned. Why not? Well, I didn't start out to write the book and say I'm not going to mention President Trump's name. Uh, but organically, as I uh, proceeded with the book, I said to myself, I really want this book to be, some to be, to be seen and more importantly, to be read, is something wider and deeper with a little more context and perspective than just going through what's wrong with President Trump and the Trump administration. And I did have in mind uh, trying to write a book that the most ardent Trump supporter you know could read the book and while not liking everything in the book would say, you know, I learned something from the book and or I I touches off some new sunbursts of thought. Now, it may or may not have accomplished that. Each reader will have to decide for themselves. But that was the goal. And as I repeat for emphasis, I didn't start out saying I'm not going to mention President Trump's name, mm -hmm. but it's kind of worked out that way. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read you a, a quote from, from the book and also from my, actually the quote is from 
Daniel Patrick Moynihan, former senator from New York. And interestingly, it's in your essay on science. But as I, as I read it, I thought, boy, this applies almost to in, in every essay you've done. This is a bit of what he said. If this nation ultimately fails, I believe it will be because opinions, propaganda, and superstitions replaced facts as the basis for our governance. And what I thought about immediately was fake news, and we can't get through the evening without at least touching on that. Fake news, if the title or the, or the phrase is new, but it's been around. This has been going on for decades, has it, it not? It has been going on for decades. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't mean this as a partisan political statement, but if we're going to discuss fake news and President Trump's uh, continuing relentless uh, effort to convince the American people as a whole that most of the news they get from professional journalists is, quote, fake news. A lot of the fake news, really fake news, comes from the president himself. That needs to be acknowledged. And, but certainly, some version of fake news has been around for a while, and this is a subject we could discuss for the rest of the evening. Rest easy, we're not going to discuss it for the rest of the evening, but, but it has been around. What's new? The following things are new. That we have a president who is dedicated to the proposition that if he can move the country finally, completely, totally, into a post-truth political era, then he can keep himself and those who believe as he do, does in power. That's the reason that we've had this talk about alternative facts, quote unquote. What's needed to offset this, to counter this, is to rise up and say, no, we're not going to let the country move into a post-truth political era or any other era. Truth matters, or as close as is humanly possible to get to the truth, and facts do matter. There is a dictionary definition of facts. Well, just for example, two and two equals four. It does not equal five, it does not equal seven, it's a fact that equals four. Water does not run uphill. Gravity is a fact. But in a world led by the power and prestige of the presidency of the United States, trying to convince people that, well, we need an era where truth, uh, everybody has their own truth. I love the Monaghan quote, and it's the reason that I put it in the book, because I think it's so important. You know, another part of that same quote was, everybody is entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. I'm pretty sure that I've read, well, I have, and I have still, as you do, have friends in, in the business, that there are newspapers whose subscription rates are actually up, and, and other things like that that point to lots of us. Well, uh, I'm glad you made that point, and it is true that newspaper subscriptions as a whole, which have been in decline for some years, since the advent of the Trump presidency, they have actually risen. And, this brings a smile to my face because, look, we, one thing, an important thing about patriotism is we, a patriot loves the country, is willing to literally die for the country, but a patriot realizes that humility is an important part of true patriotism, the kind of humility that says, listen, we are not a perfect union. As our founders wrote at the very beginning, we're in search of ever trying to form a more perfect union, but that we're, you know, we're, we're not perfect. But in the end, that with patriotism, we recognize that we have these faults. But one of the strengths of Americans in America from the beginning has been its people. Generation after generation, the American people, they're pretty good at separating bull shine from brass tacks. <laughs> and they're beginning to do so with the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I think that's one of the things 
uh, that the president is fearful of. You know, I think the best question to ask of this president and to understand some of what he's doing is to understand he is afraid. He is very afraid. He is terrorized about something. I don't know what it is, but there's something that he is hiding, that he is very fearful is going to be find out, found out. That's the reason he's constantly attacking Anybody who asks the questions, including the special prosecutor, it's the reason he's constantly on the attack against institutions, including the press, including the judiciary, and very often including Congress itself. He is afraid of something. We may find out with the Mueller investigation or otherwise what it is, but I do think that explains a lot of what can only be described as irrational behavior and comments. You've, you've seen things, maybe not quite like this, but you've seen things you know, in, the, in the decades of, of your reporting and your writing, and we see all of those through you. It's an incredible responsibility you have because you're taking all of us along for your ride. How did you make it through all of these years? How do you make it through a day? Well, I don't have any trouble making it through a day. I, you know. Uh, Right now, I get up every morning and say, I'm a lucky man to see this day. Uh, to use the old Chautauqua circuit thing, I've reached the age where I, I don't even buy green bananas. But, <laughs> <laughs> I, may I bar, may I use that line? I'll, I'll pay you a fee. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, your question about, look, uh, I can be dumb as a fence post about a lot of things, but I'm at least smart enough to know uh, how lucky I have been. I dreamed uh, from childhood of wanting to be a reporter. Uh, and uh, my only question was whether I could make a living doing it, and there were times when I wondered. But I've been very lucky to, to you know, live my dream. Uh, I, have a, I have a lot of mistakes and a, a lot of uh, shortcomings and I've made my share of mistakes, but I have a passion for covering news. So I, how I have made it through is saying to myself, even when I was fairly young, maybe 18, 19, 20 years old, boy, am I lucky to be able to do what I passionately dreamed of doing as a youngster. Now, as time gone, has gone along, uh, I have learned uh, ever increasingly of some things I should have learned earlier you know, it's been said of me that by my high school and college teachers, Dan doesn't always learn fast, but he learns good. Uh, <laughs> and that eventually, uh, it struck me the importance of gratitude, humility, and modesty. Now, humility and modesty are not words generally associated with, associated with past or present anchor people. But I can say that I have lived long enough to know the value. So now, a great deal of what gets me through any day or any difficult time. And one way I say to myself, I want to I want to see the country come through this what I have described this dark, in some ways rather nightmarish valley that we're going through now. Uh, I'm I'm sure it will happen. I'm not. Uh, I think it may take a while, and I may not be around to see it. But you know, getting through the day, and I do, I want to come back to how many people I find who are really fearful today. And I would remind you, not because we're in a house of worship, but among the most used phrases in the good book is some version of fear not. And we shouldn't be fearful, we should be determined. Because this we know, what we're going through now, this is not normal. There's a real effort to convince us that what the president has said about neo-Nazis, the sort of wink-winks to organizations as the Ku Klux Klan, this is not normal for an American president. We know this. We also know that we are better than this. We know we're better than this. That is what is going to carry us through. Now, 
back to the book, and yes, in a cr sort of crude way, I'm here to sell the book, but this is more important than the book. We, have to, we should concentrate on what unites us. We have tremendous things that unite us. The belief in law, the, the ideal, and the idea that no person is above the law. Uh, we never reach the total ideal, but we're always striving for that goal. It's, it, this, this was something new in American history. It started with the United States, that every citizen has, is entitled to due process, and that, by the way, includes the president. But the central message out of even taking that core value, that we believe in the rule of law, law that if you're fearful, if you're really concerned about the country, if you think the country's going to hell in a hack, please keep in mind that no president is stronger than the country as a whole. Hasn't been, isn't now, isn't going to be. But we have all of these other values which unite us. Uh, the, the belief in the right to vote. Uh, we've gone through any number of periods in our history where we prohibited the vote to some people, but we're now here in the 21st century, united as a people around the belief every citizen is entitled to vote. There are some few exceptions, but entitled to vote. Uh, the whole idea of, of science. Science is one of, one of the things, the study of science, the thirst to be, if not first in the world in scientific research, at least in the conversation about science research, has from the very beginning of the country, going back even as early as the 18th century when the country was founded, the whole idea was, look, America has to be among world leaders in science. Now we contrast that with what we see and hear today when there is a movement in the country that is frankly and bluntly stated anti-science. It's anti-intellectual, it's anti-knowledge. And I would submit to you that this has been a value that we have united behind in the past, and we need to stay united in front of it. The idea that, well, if 90 scientists say this is true, and 10 say, well, we have some doubt about it, the idea that journalists or anybody else have to give the same weight to the 10 who say it isn't true, to the 90 who say it is true, is contrary to what we know of how knowledge advances. But there's a chapter on science is what unites us. The arts unite us. It's something we don't think of very often. Again, you know, we have, we have been, through our history, we have been a, a, a great champion of the arts. We have led in many developments of the arts. This, too, is part of what unites us. And one reason I wanted to write the book is very easy to forget how much does unite us. Particularly, it's easy to forget when you have so many people in positions of power who want to exploit for their own partisan political purposes our divisions. So it's easy to get caught up in a thought, my gosh, I mean, we're, we're so divided we can never put ourselves together again. Uh, that uh, there's a division everywhere. We do have some very deep divisions in this society. And just to pick one up uh, where, you know, there still is an unacceptable level of racial injustice in the country. We all know it down deep in our head. Yes, we have made great progress in civil rights in my lifetime, but we know these things exist. And so we should respect dissent about the racial injustice. There's a chapter on dissent. Dissent is, is, is as American as the American Revolution. It's American to use a cliche as apple pie. And dissent, the recognition that dissent, what, what begins as something that's dissenting and is damned, frequently results in improving the country. A good example would be those women who in the uh, 19th century, back in the late 1800s, started dissenting about the fact that women didn't have the right to vote. They were damned. They were called unpatriotic. They were called radicals. In some cases, they were called Marxist, Leninist. But their dissent resulted in righting a wrong eventually. By the time we got to, what, 1917, women got the vote. So that's just one example of how dissent is not to be damned. Dissent is to be respected as an American value. 
and listen to those dissenting and then make a decision, do or do not, they not have a point. But time after time, we have these core values, which some of which I try to list in what unites us. And if we can keep our concentration on what unites us not, and not pay so much attention to those who are preaching the gospel of division, which can lead very carefully, very quickly, as I said before, in further dividing us into some form of extreme nationalism and or nativism, then we're going to be okay. It may take a while, but we're going to be okay. Well, in the, in the midst of the chapters, in the midst of dissent and, and education and science, not the chap, well, they were chapters, but the essays, comes empathy. And I just thought, what? Talk about empathy. Well, empathy is a great American value. And what I did pull from my own early experience of my mother uh, explaining to me the difference between compassion and empathy. This was at a very, very early age, and I do think it's important now, perhaps now more than ever, because there's a remarkable lack of empathy in any number of positions of powerful leadership in the country. Uh, what my mother said to me, this was, we lived in, I'm not playing humble beginnings here, but we lived in a tough neighborhood in, in Houston. And uh, there were people in the neighborhood who were really destitute. We were poor, but not destitute. And there was always an effort to help those who were des destitute. And one Christmas, my father and his brother, my uncle, were putting together some toys to give to other families, uh, a few families around us. And as a child, I said to my mother, well, mother, mother, you know, why are we giving toys away, things away? We don't have all that many ourselves. And then as children, will I sought to answer my own question. I said, well, I, I think I understand. We feel sorry for them. And she stopped what she was doing and said, no, we don't feel sorry for them, that we try very hard to understand them. And she went on to say, we try to walk in their shoes. And it's a spirit of there, but for the grace of God, go, go we. Uh, and in that short conversation, you know, as a parent, you never know what's going to affect your child. But in that short conversation, I was given to understand the difference between compassion and empathy. And we are an, an empathetic people. We have been from the beginning. We have been through our history, not consistently and always under every circumstance, but we are known around the world as an empathetic people. And we need to remember that among ourselves because it is part of what unites us, is our sense of empathy. Now here's the point. If we are to remain our beloved United States of America, if we are to remain a citadel, a beacon, if you, if you will, for things such as empathy, trying to understand how other people feel, helping people on a worldwide basis, and exhibiting some moral and ethical leadership, if we are continuing to be that citadel, then we have to hold together. And I, I, I come back to the point, if you will, that this emphasis on what unites us is so important because there's so many elements and forces trying to separate us. And we're a great experiment. You know, this American experiment is still in the great sweep of history. What we're trying to do um, is we're still a young nation and the experiment is still fairly young, seen from a historical point of view. It's always been against the odds. When we started, most of the world almost overwhelmingly said, that will never work. You can't have a mix of religion, uh, ethnicity, and race, and hold the country together. Well, here we are, well over 200 years into it, and the experiment is still underway, but this is the key thing. We have to see ourselves as still an experimental people. And the great experiment of having a constitutional republic based on the principles of freedom and democracy that is as diverse as our country, to hold it together takes a dedication each generation to the next and you can't take it for granted.
Do you ever wish you were still back on the air? Well, of course I do. <laughs> go. Here you go. It's, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Dan Rather Show. No, but, you know, I, I, I'm still on television and, and radio, so, but I know what you're doing. Of course I miss it. But, you know, I, I will say about the evening news, when I did the evening news for 24 years, uh, when it ended, mm -hmm. uh, I thought I would miss being on the air every night, and I do miss it, particularly when there's a big breaking story. Uh, you miss it. But it's not what I miss the most. What I miss the most about it is the camaraderie of the newsroom. Uh, but CBS News, when I worked there, and I haven't been there in 12 years, so I can't attest for now, but uh, was a great journalistic institution, not because I worked there, but because up and down the line you had people absolutely dedicated to the idea and the idea of quality journalism of integrity. And something important that I, I learned, and uh, I didn't think about it much until I left CBS, that at CBS News for almost all the time I was there, that the ethos of the place that we were taught to believe and we did believe that we were in a kind of mystical, magical, journalistic kingdom in which every correspondent was expected to be a champion of truth, justice in the American way and everybody in the place was committed to it. Now, the fact that that may not have been true was not as important as we believed it to be true. Mm -hmm. And because we believed it, we were better for it at that point. Uh, that, so that's what, when I say I miss the camaraderie, I, I miss that sense of, if you will, being part of that mystical, magical kingdom uh, where correspondents were champions of truth, justice, and the American way. And there is a camaraderie when you work, even in a very large organization such as CBS News, uh, when there's, there's dedication to the mission, it's inevitable that you feel a, a strong responsibility of those you're working with, and that's what I miss the most. Mm -hmm. You, you um, mentioned this a bit earlier, uh, and it's courage and, cor and being courageous that these times may call for that more than many other times. Are you courageous? Am I courageous? Mm -hmm. No, but I aspire to be. <laughs> Uh, that I do like the word. It was m my father's favorite word. And he was quick to say, not because I, speaking of himself, not because I am courageous, not because I have courage, but because I want to have courage. And he was very good about teaching that courage is, is being afraid and going ahead anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason I have a chapter on courage, I do think an aspiring to courage is one of the things that unites us. And having said that courage was my father's favorite word, my mother's favorite, favorite word was meadow, uh, for reasons she just liked the, the rhythm of the word. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that, you know, we, we have demonstrated time and time again in our history that when the big chips are on the table, when it really counts, when it counts the most, we have been, we are, and my optimism tells us, we will pretend to be a courageous people. Now, this is a time uh, that calls for courage because as I've said several times before, there are very powerful forces, some of them in the ultimate positions of, of leadership, who are trying to exploit our divisions. It takes courage to run for office. It takes courage to say, we are better than this, we're not going to let this continue. It takes courage to get active, to camp, to organize for a campaign, and get yourself and a lot of other people to the polls. Because let us not forget that in America, the ultimate decider on who's going to, ultimate decision on who's going to lead us is at the ballot box. The Washington Post recently had a phrase which caught my eye, and I liked it, which is, that if you don't like what's going on, if you hate what's going on in the country, keep in mind that the best revenge is served at the ballot box. And what happens in the congressional elections of 2018, let's have no misunderstanding about it, are going to have a great deal to do with what happens in this country for many years going forward, as will, of course, the presidential 
race in 2020. There's, um, we have a few questions from, from audience members that I want to ask uh, before we finish, but there's, I have to say, there's another quote, and I like it because it's one of my favorites too. This one comes from Dr. Martin Luther King. And Dr. King says, Martin Luther King Jr., um, pardon me, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And he very much believed that. He had faith in that. Do you? I do. And one reason I do is because I was honored and I used the word measuredly. I covered Dr. Martin Luther King for about a year and a half, almost two years, on a day-by-day, week-in, week-out basis during the early stages of the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, 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 I never hesitate to say that covering Dr. King in the Civil Rights Movement changed me as a professional and it changed me as a person. And one reason, look, Dr. King had his vulnerabilities and made his mistakes and had his weaknesses. But he, he statements such as that, which it took courage, by the way, to make that statement, particularly because he was always moment to moment on the razor's edge of death and had been for many, many years. But to have that kind of optimism, if you will, that yes, the art of history favors justice. But Dr. King on that and many other occasions went on to say, only if we continue to work to make it so. It's not gonna happen just magically. And I've expressed here my own optimism, but it's not a Pollyannish kind of optimism. My optimism is based on, on our history of how we have always uh, coalesced behind those things that unite us, but it has to be done again every generation to every generation. There isn't going to be a change in the direction of the country. There isn't going to be an end to what I've described as this long, dark nightmare of a valley unless we act. It isn't going to just happen magically, which is basically what Dr. King was saying. Which is what he's saying. I, we have a, a few questions here before we finish for the evening, and then I have something that I want you to take us out of here with, which we... We These talked are questions about, from the audience. These are from the audience. Right. And I'm going to paraphrase a little because I can't read <laughs> these very well. But I'm going to try. Uh, one, of, one of our audience members talks about a husband and father that she has. Both are retired military. How do you approach a civil discussion so that my feelings do not derail that discussion? And by the way, they both are Trump supporters, not just Republicans. I want to she make says. sure, well, I appreciate the question, and uh, I, I want to listen especially carefully to the question. I'm not sure I understand how do they, how do they keep it from what? Probably from erupting, am I right, and into a, a shouting match, and, and, uh, and okay, she's concerned, too, that her own feelings yeah. don't derail a discussion. How do you do that? Well, uh, how I do it personally is not very well. <laughs> no, but uh, it, it's a serious question and a very good question. Here are my, my suggestions, but I, I, there's a short preface that, look, I hope, folks, it is clear this time of what you're looking at here. I'm a reporter. I'm a lifetime reporter. I'm a reporter who got lucky. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a psychologist, and I don't really feel qualified to give people advice on this, except I want to be helpful, and I really do appreciate the question. I think... First of all, something we mentioned earlier, listen. Listen to the other person's point of view and be prepared to listen very carefully. Uh, so often we don't listen to one another uh, at all or we begin to listen and we get shut off. But for a person of a diametrically opposed political view, whether it's an individual policy issue or an issue of parties or support for the president, uh, I recommend listening really listening, and then following up to questions uh, where the voice is moderated. You know, too often these things result in shouting matches. And one of the worst things about the Trump presidency uh, is, as I said before, the, the whole tone and tenor of the rhetoric. So in the hypothetical situation, I think, listen. Listen very carefully to the other point of view. And perhaps at some point, rather than 
offering your counterpoint of view to say, I understand what you've said, and I want to think about that for a while. Would not be a bad approach. Okay, and this actually is a, a good one for, for the journalist in you. Are you concerned, as am I, about the shrinking of local news organizations and the lack of coverage of city, state, and county, I told you I can't see, <laughs> and county elected officials and governments. I believe this has contributed to the loss of respect for journalists and for government both. I agree on all counts. Uh, and this is something, again, I've said several times that I think the public at large perhaps hasn't paid enough attention to, but it is a very important development, not just for journalists and, and journalism. And that is, the, what's happened in American journalism is the, the old business model that would support for newspapers, radio, and to some extent television, that would support uh, even costly but valuable forms of journalism, such as first-class international or foreign reporting, deep digging investigative reporting. The business model for that uh, is either dead or dying. And nobody has, with very few exceptions, no one has come up with a new business model that will, on a consistent year-in, year-out basis, finance first-class international reporting, deep drilling investigative reporting, or for that matter, covering the state legislature, or the county supervisor's office, or county judge's office, or the city office. In state capital after state capital, just to use one example, in state capital after state capital, the number of news organizations covering what happens in your state government, the number of reporters who are serving as that check and balance on state government power uh, has shrunk dramatically to the point, and I, I sometimes get in trouble for saying this, but I'm gonna say it anyway because it's true, to the point that one of the major centers of corruption, political corruption in the country today, exists in state capitals and state legislatures and state governments, and one of the reasons is the decline of journalistic coverage of those events. That we focus so much on what's happened in Washington, and mind you, that even in Washington, the amount of coverage for newspapers, and particularly local and regional newspapers, has really shrunk. Now, part of this, and we won't, I'll try not to lengthen this out, but part, it's very important to understand. Part of this is because there's been consolidation of media, as it's called, which is to say, ever larger corporate giants, most of them international conglomerates, increasingly are, have bought out journalistic enterprises, and when they do so, in order to increase their profits, they cut the actual news gathering resources down. And each time a company is sold to a larger company and becomes part of a larger company, then something goes out uh, of, of journalistic coverage. And think about this as something to think about is maybe if you leave and want to talk about the subject. We've reached the point today where well over 80% of the news platforms that are truly national in distribution, well over 80%, are owned by no more than six, my count is four, no more than six very large international conglomerates. The effect of that has been two very important things. One, it has decreased the amount of, of competition, real competition. And number two, and there's no gentle way to say this, it's created a situation where when it comes to national distributed news, big business is in bed with big government in Washington, whether that government be under Democratic or Republican Party at a given time, uh, to have news that benefits them. The big corporations have legislation they want passed or stopped. They have regulations they want uh, done away with. They have all kinds of things in that of Washington. And the powers that be in Washington, again, in this instance, it is to some extent bipartisan, 
they want a certain kind of what I call sweetheart coverage. So if you take the point, big business in, in bed with big government results in news for their mutual benefit, not for the benefit of the, of the American public as a whole. That the idea of news being, at least to some degree, a public service and in the public service has virtually disappeared from the upper reaches of American journalism. And if by chance anybody doesn't understand it, it's very important that you do so. And um, another question for you, where do you see us, the US, as a world power in three years down the road? Well, I appreciate the question and I'll try to answer it, but please understand <laughs> that I think maybe on my best days I'm a half decent reporter about what has happened or is happening. I have learned when it comes to predicting the future in a phrase I'm not any good at it at all, uh, that <laughs> I have learned that he who lives by the crystal ball learns to eat broken glass. And <laughs> I've eaten more of my share. Having said that, having said that, and I, I think I understand the question behind the question. There's so much talk about we're in decline that America has reached that point where uh, ancient Rome went through it, the even more ancient Greeks went through it, and that now we're going through it, and that we're in decline. It may be slow, but it is perceptible. I don't buy it for a second. Uh, you said three years out, 10 years out. I know all the theories. China's on the rise and is going to be the, the nation of the 21st century. Uh, that, we're, that we've had it. I don't believe it for one second, particularly if we get a grip on ourselves. If what I have described the feeling of, folks, this is not normal. We're better than this. And if we can unite around our true values, uh, I think that ahead in the future, that we have every opportunity for our sons and daughters and grandsons and daughters and, and their offspring to have the 21st century be at least as good for the United States or better than the 20th century was. But that can happen only if we unite around our core values. But I don't buy the idea that it's inevitable that China will surpass us as a economic and military power and an influence of events around the world. Could it happen? Yes. Is it destiny for it to happen? No. It is up to us. And I mentioned something before, that we, we, we have been for quite a long time now, and this is not braggadocio, and it's not submitting to some kind of jingoism or national, from foreign nationalism. We have been a beacon of hope for the world, and this is part of our strength. And one reason I'm optimistic, medium and long range about the country, is because with all of our faults, that we remain a beacon of hope uh, for many, many places around the world. We are seen, again, with, uh, with our weaknesses, with our vulnerabilities, and with our mistakes, still seen, uh, in Abraham Lincoln's phrase, the best hope for mankind. And there is strength in that, because strength is not just military power or economic power. Strength is also the power to inspire and to persuade. Uh, we, were, we got pretty good at that in the 20th century. There's no reason we can't continue it in the 21st century, but again, only if we stand united. All of this moves you, doesn't it? Uh, even with my faulty eyeglasses, I can still see your eyes and your face. This all moves you, doesn't it? Of course it means it moves me. Why wouldn't it? Uh, you know, I'm an American to the core, uh, right to my, to my very being, and I don't apologize for that at all. Would you do us, all of us, the honor 
of, do, uh, of reading the last paragraph in your book. It's a paragraph that I've read several times, and I would tell you that for me, it's an anthem, and it's probably something I will keep reading because I share those words. I tell you, that's the ultimate compliment, and I very much appreciate it. I will do that. In doing so, I do want to thank you for taking this on tonight, and thank you for your kind thank words. You. And I will, at your request, read it. And now, for those of you uh, who may have a book, I guess this being a Methodist church, I can say, for those of you who are going to sing along in your hymnals <laughs> with us, uh, uh, this, is, this is the very end of the book on page 270. It's the last thing in the book. Quote, I understand that my time to shape and help this world is passing. This is the circle of life. I hope now to inspire others to love this country, to pledge to work hard to make it a healthier and more just place to live. I ultimately have faith in the basic decency of our American citizenry, and indeed people around the globe. I believe strongly that the core tenets I love most about this nation can be a foundation for commonality and strength once more. I believe in a wide and expansive vision of our national destiny. And I believe in all of you to help make it a reality, courage. Thank you. Thank you.